Yes, it's recording. Oh, it's going on cloud. So she has made a cloud setting, Minakshi. Okay. Um, okay. Now I'm going to live on Facebook and then we can get started. Sharp. Um, page. Next. But these lecture series, I am also enjoying. The India ones are also very good. I um, I created like space in my schedule. I said, let me try and attend lecture number two. Doctor Anupama. Okay, tell me your spelling. K I Z H A K K E. V E E G T I L. And now say for me how you say it. <laughs> Kira K V T I L. Say it again. Kira K V T I L. Kira K V T I L. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> okay, Kira K V T I L. Yeah. Because I have always read it, never heard from you or anybody. Yeah, yeah. So I it, thought it would be it good. Has to all the say it correctly. Kira K V T I L. You got it nicely. Yeah. Oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, not bad. Okay, we still have five minutes. So I'm going to hold on to. So, how old is Krishna? Krishna is good, 13 now. Oh, really? Oh. Wow. Time flies so fast, right? Yes, time flies. My God. How old is your son, Vandana? Oh, my son is 15. Mm. He is a 10th grader. Nice. Mine are quite old. As yeah, know. it's all done, right, Pradeva? I still That's remember. Pradeva, I appreciate and admire that they are highly accomplished in their fields already. Yeah, they're like, extremely right. talented. Yes, the things Great you talent. share on Facebook, I see that much only, but it seems pretty nice. Especially yeah. your daughter is so talented into so many right. things. But son also, PhD, yes, actually, PhD something, right? He's, he's after undergrad straight into PhD, physics, yeah. cosmology, yeah. and he has published his first scientific paper. You saw that. And in physics, what's his speciality? I mean, this cosmology. Is, cosmology, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> how did you manage and how did they manage? <laughs> For me, the college is a stress. Oh my God, he has been into that for a long time and he was doing a triple major actually when yeah. he dropped half. So he did a double major in physics and astronomy and then minor in philosophy. And then straight okay. went into PhD. Oh so my God. that boy has been like that. Okay, three more minutes. Sorry, I'm just keeping an eye on the time so that we start mm -hmm. on time. Hmm. So, so far, no one has joined in, in um, Zoom. Nobody has requested to join on Zoom. Um, but we are, you know, getting good. At the end, there is a question and answer session. Do you want to? Yes, if, yes. If, if there are, I'm just seeing how many views, but, you know, good views are coming now uh, yesterday sri ranjani's has crossed 200 views and okay. uh, that's fair enough like we didn't promote it very extensively but whatever we have is is getting across okay So I know I will be calling Krishna. I meant it. Okay. <laughs> I definitely will be calling him. Just waiting to finish a lot of projects that I have taken on by 20th November. I think I will be. Okay. Major part will be done. So what else is new? I know. Two more minutes to go. <laughs> Ayurveda Day celebration is coming up at SCU. Yes. 
Oh, you know what? I think Dinah wants to join. So I think what happened is uh, because the link is not there, so no one is going to be joining. Yes, yeah. unless they ask for it. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, let's go live. One, two, three. I'm going live. Yes, we are live now. All right, Dr. Vandana, I'm going to introduce you and then we can get started. Welcome Dr. Anu and Dr. Vandana to today's lecture, second lecture in a series of five lectures in United States. And um, Dr. Vandana will be talking um, a little more in detail about what we are offering in celebration of Ayurveda Day uh, for the whole week. But I will like to begin uh, today's um, session by introducing Dr. Vandana. Mm, Professor Vandana Baranbal is a leading Ayurveda expert specializing in women's health. She has more than 25 years of experience involving various aspects of clinical research, uh, teaching and education in Ayurveda. Growing up in Banaras, India, she has been very fortunate to learn from some of the world's most renowned and respected teachers and takes pride in her heritage and feels honored to pass it on to the next generation. So with that brief introduction, you can find more details about her profile on our website, ayurvedaresearchusa.org. With that, uh, Dr. Vandana, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Pratiba, and thank you for the nice words about me. And uh, hello everyone, namaste everyone. On behalf of the Council for Ayurveda Research, I welcome you all to the second lecture of the lecture series we are presenting to celebrate the Ayurveda Day. And to talk about Ayurveda Day, it is a special event we celebrate every year on Dhanvantari Day. Every year on Dhanvantari Day, we pay our respects to the sages of Ayurveda who handed down this science of life for the benefit of entire humanity. We pay our homage, we pay our respect. And this year, Dhanvantari Day is falling on November 13th. Ayurveda embodies the principles of natural and sustainable living. And this year, the celebration is specifically aimed at promoting the UN WHO Sustainable Development Goal 3 to ensure healthy lives and promote well being for all ages. We at Council for Ayurveda Research. Uh, I would say that uh, first, what kind of Council for Ayurveda Research is, it is a 501c3 nonprofit, and we are proud to be a global partner in promoting and participating in the worldwide initiative to celebrate Ayurveda Day. And to commemorate this momentous occasion, we are delighted to offer two five-day free lecture series, one in India, and uh, uh, by the NGO, our sister concern, Ayurveda Anusandhan Abhiyan Foundation, and one lecture series in USA. And it is going on from 9th November. We started from yesterday. And in today's le uh, lecture, uh, the second lecture, the presenter is Dr. Anupma. Dr. Anupma is a long lasting, uh, has been a long lasting board of director for Council for Ayurveda Research also. I'm very proud to have her here as a speaker today. Uh, and I will uh, throw light on her illustrious career in Ayurveda. Uh, uh, she is an Ayurvedic practitioner, licensed ac acupuncturist, yoga teacher, a professor and program director of Ayurvedic medicine at Southern California University of Health Sciences. She received her degree in Ayurvedic medicine from Mangalore University. Her master's of acupuncture and oriental medicine is from Southern California University of Health Sciences and her PhD is from Paulding University. Her many contributions to the field of complementary and alternative medicine include extensive travel to propagate Ayurveda worldwide, numerous research presentations at national and international conferences, frequent publications in various peer-reviewed research journals, regular participation as peer review, reviewer at conferences as well as journals. 
She currently serves on the research working group of the Academic Collaborative for Integrative Health and is co-principal investigator for NIH funded research study. Many of her research papers have earned special recognition at the conferences where they were presented, and she has received a number of awards for her work on Ayurveda and complementary and alternative medicine. So over to Dr. Anu, we, wait, uh, we can start your presentation now. Thanks, Dr. Vandana. Thank you very much for the introduction. And I would like to thank uh, Council of Ayurvedic Research and Dr. Pradibha for making this event, like one week event for Ayurveda celebration, giving a different lecture series to educate our community about the research. So wonderful job. Thank you very much. So let me uh, share my screen. Give me a second, please. I hope you can see the screen. Yes, we can. You're good to start. Yeah, thank you. So for topic for today is systematic reviews and why it is needed in Ayurvedic research. So what is systematic review? Many of you know this. Uh, systematic review helps to generate the best available external evidence by searching literature systematically to answer a clinically relevant and clearly defined question. So systematic review is a review in which there is a comprehensive search for relevant study on a specific topic. And those identified are then appraised and synthesized according to the predetermined and explicit method. So if you look at the hierarchy of evidence, you can see that in the systematic review at the highest evidence level, right? It starts from editorial expert opinion, then case series, then higher level is case control, then cohort studies, RCT and systematic review. So it does give more importance compared to other research methods. So what is important of systematic review? Why it is considered as highest evidence? So basically combining finding from the different studies and bring the best evidence it identified the bias or any errors in studies conducted and identify the areas which doesn't have sufficient evidence. So that will give opportunity for other researchers to conduct the research, right? So it enabled the practitioners to keep up to date and practice evidence-based medicine. And it helps to answer the question, is that specific method of care? Is it an effective care? Is it safe? Any specific intervention? Is it safe to use it? Or it also, the information available from the systematic review can be used in creating a specific guidelines. So any method, any question related with the guideline and create want to create a policy related about any kind of intervention. So the data we can get from the systematic review. Why you should, why if we should use the systematic review? It's facilitate rational decision making. Healthcare providers and researchers and policymakers are intended with so many number of studies, right? We know like how many studies are published in every year. More than twenty thousand medical journal. More than millions of articles are published in every year. Uh, about our city, also more than million our city is publishing every year. And same, same for the diagnostic studies as well. So when you look at all this, so much information is coming out. How do we determine which study I should use, which method of intervention I should use, I should use based upon the evidence? So much information. So what does systematic review? It summarized the literature, right? So if already some topic which published about summarizing the result, what is our are done there. For example, if there is a study done on low back pain, there are 50 studies are there or more than that. But if we can get a report summarizing all those study, that will be the best option, right? So that's where the idea of systematic review comes. So how do we do that? How to, is there is a specific method we need to follow to summarize those information? So that's where the systematic review's importance comes in. But what is the difference of systematic review and traditional review? We know there are a lot of traditional review literature also there. What is the difference between these two review? 
In traditional review, there is no specified inclusion criteria. It's unclear how included studies were selected. There is no like very strict uh, uh, inclusion exclusion criteria is determined for traditional review. And maybe based on an incomplete set of studies as well. And they won't consider the quality of included studies. So method may not be transparent and unclear how the conclusion follow from the uh, included study. So, so that's what traditional review does it. So it, they don't have a very strict guideline or they don't do the review in a systematic way. So what are the steps in conducting the systematic review? You know, another important thing I like about systematic review, you know, you don't have to spend so much money to conduct this type of research studies. You just need a teamwork here. So the first and foremost uh, step is formulate the research question. You need to have a research question and you need to define the inclusion and exclusion criteria. After defining that you have to do the systematic literature search and then you select the studies based on the inclusion exclusion criteria then assess the quality of the included study. Then you extract the data from the included study. After that, summarize the evidence, then discuss the review finding and draw conclusion. Finally, you need to be presented in a way that editor accepts for the publication as well as the conference presentation. So basically disseminate the information. I'm going to go over each step a little more in detail. So the first is formulate a research question. Same for any research study, first and foremost, we need to have a research question. It will be specific problem within a broad area. So if your question is well-defined, well-formulated, which will guide you to the many aspect of the review process. It always important to that, come to the narrowing the question. So if you have a broader question, it's very difficult to answer it and difficult to create the methodology. So as much as possible, try to narrow your question. Usually when I complete, write the systematic review, it's couple, it takes time to immediately, the first question what you write doesn't come, it always change. After, after so many review process, narrowing it down again and again, you will get specific measurable research question, which will be more discreet and manageable for inclusion criteria and less heterogeneity. If the research question is more broad, it's very difficult to identify the studies with the homogeneous quality. So there is a possibility of heterogeneous studies included. Okay, so you want to avoid that. That's why even in the at the initial stage itself, try to narrow your research question as much as possible. Be more specific. That's it. So PICO is, you know, PICO format is effectiveness for uh, developing the question. So here P is a patient or population. It defines subject group like age, sex, race, and other patient characteristics. I is intervention, consider the intervention of interest. C, comparison group with the, whom initially defined population and the intervention would be compared to. Outcome, what you want to accomplish or what you want to measure or what you want to define. So use the PICO format and define the research question will be really helpful. So for example, is an integrative approach that include CAM therapy and conventional medical care more effective for the management of low back pain than either alone? This is one of the systematic review I published actually. So I just took that question from that study. I use the PICO format here. Here P is the patient with the low back pain. I integrative approach that combine CAM therapy and conventional medical care and C is either alone, and you hear O outcome is improvement in the low back pain. And we have selected the study which has a which has used a validated outcome measure. So those factors you can explain in your inclusion criteria. So this is the another important steps in a systematic review: defining inclusion and exclusion criteria. So once you have the research question, next you need to decide what type of study you want to include and what type of study you want to exclude. Once you are very clear with that, this will help you to do the next step for literature search. If this section is not written clearly, then you may have to come back while doing a literature search to again here to fix this section. Okay, so usually high evidence level studies such as RCT and well-conducted level two studies must be included. However, 
if the review question is such that not much work has been done in the field, then it is okay to include the lower level studies as well. Sometimes this happen actually uh, in Ayurveda or yoga, uh, sometimes even in the Chinese medicine also. In a certain topic, we don't have enough publication. So if there is no enough RCTs or level one uh, well-conducted studies are published, so then you can go to the next, next level of studies to include, but as long as you justify that in the methodology, if you explain that in the methodology section, you will be okay. And then next step is to define the language. Do you want to do a systematic review on studies published only in English or studies published in, if it is a Chinese medicine topic, studies published in English and Taiwanese, so whatever the language, Chinese language. So that part you need to define and explain in the methodology and they define the time frame of publication. Uh, up to how many years of publication are you looking to re for the review process? You shall last five years. But I would say for Ayurvedic medicine and all, since there is not enough publication, even you can look for the pub, uh, studies which is out there so far, whatever is published on that particular topic can be considered. But that needs to be defined in early stage. And decide to include either human studies or animal study, or if you want to include both, you know that also need to be defined. So. This inclusion exclusion criteria, as I mentioned earlier, help us to do the search, literature search and explaining what type of studies you are included in the systematic review. After this, this will be the next easiest step, systematic literature search. This will take time. So systematic review is not an, you know, one month job or two months, it take time. Some of the systematic review I completed, it took almost, a, minimum eight months to one year to finish it you know it, it does need a lot of literature search to make sure you are getting all the information pertaining to that particular topic based on your inclusion exclusion criteria so the literature search strategy must be defined one must identify main theme within the review question and find many keyword and medical subject heading mesh term for each thing. So PubMed Meshtom will be really helpful to identify the uh, search word. I would highly encourage to use the mesh word for search uh, when you do the systematic review. So then keyboard will need to be connected using the appropriate Boolean operator keywords actually. So and or not. And then after that, all possible relevant electronic database must be searched. For Cochrane review, minimum of three database need to be searched, like PubMed or Medline through the PubMed, Embase, Scopus, Cochrane Control Trial Register, all that section, we can do a literature search. But don't try to do only the uh, search engine is only as a PubMed. Use multiple database that bring more credibility for your literature search. Then appropriate search filter. And we, as we explained in the inclusion criteria, so duration, type of the studies, animal or human uh, studies, or which language, et cetera, should be selected. So when you do the literature search, uh, selecting this filter really help. It actually reduces our work much, much, much. Okay, How many hours of work can be reduced by using the search filter, okay? And then based on electronic database search and search landmark article published in that field also must be done. Search of the literature must be done to include the additional studies. So once you get those articles, once you decide these are the studies you want to include, you can also look at the reference section of those study article and then determine you know, whether these studies can be included or not. Or there may be some published uh, literature books are, you have to look at those also. So whatever available about that particular subject, particular topic. So thorough literature search is needed. Otherwise our studies can be incomplete. So, so not just through the data, using mesh data, mesh terminology, and then uh, using only the database, the published studies reference section and looking again, do a one more search will be really helpful. It will make your review process really strong. Okay, so more time consuming factor where I see for systematic review is systematic literature search. Because you want to make sure you are getting all the published article based on your inclusion exclusion criteria of the topic. 
So next is selection of the study. Here, selection of the study should be based on, again, inclusion exclusion criteria. Once all the relevant article has been collected, there is a chance duplicate should be removed. Sometimes I have seen that sometimes like 100 plus article comes as a duplicate because you are using a multiple search engine, right? So there is a chance that duplicate will be there, not chance, there will be, usually there will be duplicates and you, you have to make sure that remove that one. And then title of the study should be read and remove the relevant one, irrelevant one. And this can be done by two reviewers. So any article where consensus has not been reached, that article should be retained at this stage. Sometimes, you know, usually at this stage of the process, multiple reviewers can be involved. So, and then they will go through the title. And if there is, if you're not sure, at this stage, you are not even reading the art complete full text article, okay? So only looking at the title, and if you think it is not sure whether this study should be included, meet with your other reviewer who is involved in this process and discuss. And if you cannot reach to the consensus, please don't include that study. And then you have to note, note it down why you are, how many number of articles didn't include at that stage, okay? After that, abstract of the article must be collected, read. And at this point, if they don't meet the inclusion criteria again, so sometimes just reading the uh, article title, you won't be able to decide, right? And then maybe you decide, okay, this study can be included, but reading the abstract, you may think, oh, this won't be based on our inclusion criteria. Then you will remove at that point. After reading the abstract, if you think that this study doesn't include based on your inclusion criteria, please remove the article at that point. Then after that only you are requesting for the full text article. And this must be read to decide if they should be included or not. So in general glance of the full text article, and then decide, okay, this study can be in or out at that point. Because you don't want to get like, you know, sometimes when you do the initial search, I, some of the review, I have got 2000 plus article in early stage. You don't want to remove all these 2000 article full text, right? First of all, it's expensive. Each article, not every article you can get through your library. And so that's where we go this step-by-step -step cleaning and then decide at the end what exactly you want to include the article. Then after that full text article, reference of those included article also can be checked to identify other studies which can be included. So that's why all these process take time, you know, and a lot of uh, uh, meeting with your other team members to make sure everybody is having consensus. When, once you have the final article, every, all your team should be agreed, this is the number of articles, this is the article you would like to include in the study. So this is a Prisma chart. Actually, this, this chart really, really, really helped me while writing the systematic review. Prisma is an evidence-based minimum set of item for reporting systematic review and meta-analysis. So Prisma flowchart for literature search and selection of studies at each stage provide visual image of flow of information through the review process. So you can see here how many studies like identified through the database searching additional record identified. So only through the search engine, like 569. Then additional database search at one study. Then how many duplicate? Look at out of these, there are about 388 studies were duplicate, right? So then you screen, uh, uh, sorry, only they got 388 studies, the remaining were duplicates. And out of 388, they again, 340 excluded and they only selected full test article assist only 48. And in this column, like the box, you can see that the reason for exclusion, they kind of explain why some of the studies were duplication, some of the study doesn't explain the diagnostic criteria, some of the study doesn't have a proper comparison control as explained in the inclusion criteria. So all this, based on all this criteria, you exclude X number of studies. And then look at the study, how much studies included in the quantitative synthesis is 20. And then quantitative, qualitative synthesis also 20. So out of 570 study, after going through all kind of, you know, reviewing, only 20 studies you include. You can see how that, how much that process, right? So all these processes are very important and 
do it very carefully so that we can include the best quality of the study explained our inclusion criteria. So the next one is assessment of the quality of included study. So now we have all the studies, right? We decide how many studies we are going to do. Like for example, in the previous uh, uh, Prisma uh, chart, we saw the 20, study, 20 studies we included. Now we need to look at the quality of the study. Once the studies are shortly listed, their quality analysis must be done the study design and level of evidence of included study must be determined. Look at the design of the study and the level of evidence. Internal external validity, that is an important part, whether study have the external validity, whether study has have the internal validity. Any bias, different type of bias, assessment bias, right? So different type of bias you can assess in the study, whether study excluded, like doesn't have any type of bias. We need to assess that. And quality checklist, critical appraisal skill program can be useful tool to identify the strength and weakness of the study. So basically under this stage, what we are looking at is, we are individually reading each study and looking at the, all these factors, level of evidence, study design, and whether external validity, internal validity, any kind of bias. And main, in a nutshell, we are looking at the strength and weakness of the study at this point. So there are different scale you can use it actually for, you know, it's, uh, there are already well-defined uh, checklist uh, provide available online to use for a systematic review. Haddad scale and Cochrane risk bias scale are some of the examples. So basically, when you read each, if you are three or four people involved in the systematic review, once you decide X number of article, each one of them will read the article and complete the form. So for example, here, so I just, I don't want to go through everything, but you can see here, source of bias. Uh, it's a risk of bias evaluating scale. So here, what is the method of randomize? Uh, what's the method of randomization is adequate? Possible answer, yes, no, unsure. So after reading the full text article, you're going to answer each of this question under yes, no, or unsure format. And then you will add the number and then you will determine the qualitative, uh, quantitative analysis of the study here. So here, the same way about the performance bias, attrition bias, selection bias are ex uh, explained. There is another tool which I, in my last systematic review, I used the Cochrane risk of bias tool. It's really, really helpful, very well defined and easy to evaluate the study based on the scale. Again, you can see here, this explain like selection bias, and reporting bias, et cetera. And then it explained how do you like high risk of bias, low risk of bias and unclear. On based on what criteria you will say a study is a high risk of bias. Based on what criteria you will say a study is low risk of bias. Based on what criteria you might need to report that not, not described or sufficient in detail. Unclear bias, unclear risk of bias. So those are the three category about Cochrane risk of bias tool explain. And it is available online. And uh, I would highly recommend for systematic review to use this tool. Very easy to follow through actually. Okay, and here also it's about the performance bias, about the blinding detection bias, and then again, attrition bias, etc. So most of the systematic review, we can see that used to usually RCT. Oh, before I forget, even, you know, I recently came across with another article a, a few years back, it's not recently. There are uh, separate study published on what type of scale needs to be used in specific uh, uh, topic for, to, for the research. Like if you are doing a low back pain study, what will be the best risk of bias scale? You can use it for a systematic review. There are so many systematic reviews are done in other uh, healthcare uh, science program, like in a chiropractic, acupuncture program, and conventional medicine, definitely. There are so many systematic reviews are there. So 
if you want to do something in the field of Ayurveda also, it is easy for us to identify which risk of bias scale needs to be used. And then also to set up that inclusion exclusion criteria, it is, it, we have a foundation, we can follow through it, you know. It's not that hard to come up with a guideline or come up with a methodology to be followed for Ayurveda systematic review. So this is like our RCT, you know, RCT studies uh, flow chart. You all may be knowing this flow chart in RCT. Look at assess the population of eligibility and determined inclusion. And then we have excluded number and these people here we do the randomization, right? So intervention group and control group. So when we do the randomization of intervention and control group, there is a chance of selection bias. Does the article address the selection bias? Did they consider and make sure there is no selection bias is happening? That is one point you need to look at. And then here intervention group, experimental intervention, they will go through it. And control group will go through the control intervention. And here the practitioner, when they do the perform this intervention, is there is a performance bias. Did the article address, the authors address, the, or the researcher address the performance bias? If yes, how did they control the performance bias? Usually you see this information under methodology. Then there is a follow-up outcome measures, right? Both the group will go through the follow-up outcome measure. If there is attrition and detection bias, is the article, is the author explaining about this thing, attrition rate, etc. So this is commonly seen kind of a bias and majority of the well-conducted RCT study usually explain these factors under their methodology section, okay? Okay, next one. Um, so now we have the, so we got, we decided about X number of article we will include in the study. Then three, if you have a three reviewer, they all read through this article. Usually what we do, you know, not all the article, if you have selected 20 article, we usually meet once a week or once in two weeks, may decide first five article we will read and then we'll discuss it. We'll meet together and discuss and go through the risk of bias scoring. And if there is no consensus, we'll discuss about it and reach into the consensus so that everybody scores, you know, everybody agree, okay, this is what it is, why it is no, or why it is yes, or why it is unsure. That discussion needs to be done and then we'll finish. And then another one month, we will read the remaining article. So it's, it's a step-by-step -step process here. Once we collect all that information, once we read all the articles, extraction of the data from included study, that is important. You all know that data are really powerful for the research. Data, data is very important, right, for research studies. So once the quality of article has been determined, the relevant data from the study, okay, then based on the review question, data need to be extracted. So data should be filled in a well-designed spreadsheet. So that is another important step, create a really detailed spreadsheet, which very well-defined title and extract the data from the full text article, whatever you want to report in your systematic review, you know, you collect that, you report it in Excel sheet. I would say initially include everything what you think appropriate, you know, collect all the data as much as possible. And then later while writing the manuscript, you know, sometimes you can exclude it, but you don't have to go back and read it again, you know? So that's why initially I would recommend, please collect everything, you know, collect as much as important data in the Excel sheet. And later while writing the manuscript, you can decide what needs to be included and what needs to be excluded. That's the methodology I usually use it. And I feel that is really helpful. After this step is the summarizing the evidence comes. This is another very, very important step because now you may, some studies, some of the study may have 40 articles to review. So summarizing the evidence, how do we bring it to the core, the take home point from that research study is very important. So extracted data need to be summarized to draw a valid conclusion. Sometimes, you know, we have to use the statistical tool to produce a quantitative review. That's why it's called meta-analysis. When we use the start part in the systematic review to reach into a, a conclusion, then it is a meta-analysis. But if you are using a qualitative summaries done for each study, then it is considered as systematic review. 
So you don't want to include everything from the results section from the studies published, right? You have to look at, you have to retrieve the information as a take home point or more important point. That is what he, here comes in. So then uh, after that, the discussing the review finding and drawing the conclusion. Here also, it's, you have to use your own point, even in the summarizing part. And during the discussion, the authors need to come up with their own way of explaining things here. It's not from the studies published. Based on the studies published, what do you think? Key finding about each of this main outcome. What is the strength of the evidence about the outcome measure should be asked? What is, what is the important uh, of this conclusion of the each studies? What is the strength of that study? What it brings to the public? The limitation and strength of the studies and others are on opinion or review must be also included. Is there is any limitation? Maybe some studies have more uh, performance bias and they didn't even mention. Some studies have a lot of dropout. Some studies have a lot of adverse events reported. They just said that adverse event is reported. They didn't explain all the adverse events detail. Or some studies didn't even mention about the adverse event. They said that the X number of people dropped out from the study. There is no reason for the dropout. So some studies may have performance bias. Some studies may be random allocation bias, like you know the, the doctor or practitioner who is treating the patient select the, okay, this person can come to this group, that person can go to the other group. That can cause a selection bias, right? You never know. So that's why before you even say that this study is really good, this information or study result is really valid, very good for the, uh, to prepare some kind of guideline or policy, etc. We need to look at the study thoroughly. We need to read the study thoroughly. So the result obtained must be compared to those of our studies. You know, whatever is there, if you have included 20 studies, then you can uh, X interventional could be in one you know, section of discussion and another can be another section. You can divide based on the certain criteria and then you discuss it. Like for example, in my study, a systematic review for acupuncture and chiropractic and conventional medicine kind of study, during the discussion, I uh, put all the acupuncture studies together, all chiropractic studies together, and the studies which is used integrative acupuncture and conventional or chiropractic and conventional, that's together. So you can use, others can decide which way you want to write your discussion state. What do you want to compare? how you want to report your result of the study. That is very important. How the result can affect clinical practice policy and need a few future research must be. And then based on this result, maybe there is an option that uh, other research study needs to be conducted, including A, B, C, D factors, you know? So that decision also, or that information also can be come out based on the systematic review. If there is inconclusive result, that should be also reported. Sometimes even after review, I actually one of my, I did a systematic review on yoga uh, and it was really difficult to reach into a you know, um, well-defined conclusion because we could not identify a study with the homogeneous goal. There is a lot of heterogeneity in the studies, study design. So if that is the key, that also need to be explained right? And that will give, we can tell in the, under the conclusion that future studies are needed by including A, B, C, D, extra factors, okay? So this is a summary part. Actually, this really, really helped me when I was writing a systematic review. If you look at this, like here, it, this table shows that, you know, define the question, and then after that, set the eligibility criteria for included study, then plan the method of review, then, uh, you know, you do the literature search. There are studies published under this stage also. If you do a Google search, you can find uh, publishing the protocol of systematic review. There are a couple of studies out there, out there, only up to this level. And then another pa one paper they published just explaining the protocol used for conducting a systematic review. Then after that, you do the literature search and then screen the study again as the eligibility criteria. 
and then collect the data and assess the risk of bias scale. So you can determine at that, you know, in, in early stage of the systematic review itself, you can determine what type of risk of bias scale you would like to use and then analyze it and summarize the result, then interpret the result and draw conclusion. This is a very important step, interpreting the result and reaching that proper conclusion because this can play a major role in so many other future decision-making process. So you don't want to make any error at this stage also, okay? So uh, collecting the data, analyzing and summarizing, interpreting the result and reaching conclusion is very important. And then you can publish the review and update and improve the review again. Now, some people do the lit after a certain year, again, they do the another review because there are so many articles published you know, every year. So you can do another review like after five years or after 10 years about the same topic, looking at the article, what all are published after your first sit systematic review. Okay, so that so this is a summary theme. So if any of you are interested in writing a systematic review, I think this tool is really will be helpful to plan it. The next writing for publication. So preferred reporting items in systematic review and meta-analysis checklist. That is Prisma. Many of you know this, right? The Prisma is very very important. Uh, this. It's actually life saving. So it's so very clear, very precise. If you follow through it, it makes your writing or conduct all throughout the systematic review process is really helpful. It is available online, and this checklist is commonly used while preparing and man preparing for the manuscript for publication. So all the systematic review and meta analysis should be registered under Prospero, and registrator number should be submitted at the time of manuscript submission. And this is the another checklist. So once you've complete the process, right? Conducting the systematic review while writing, this is the tool. This is the tool I, I used uh, this checklist to make sure in my manuscript, each section, whatever I need to include, I have included it. So you can use this as a checklist. So how the title, how should you write the title? And initially you may have a general title, right? But for a manuscript submission, you want to make sure your title is very precise and concise and convey the information about the study clearly. And then structured summary, how the abstract should be written, how the introduction, what all are the uh, section needs to be included under introduction paragraph, the rationale for the study, and what is the objective of the systematic review. Those two factors should become under introductory fact and the background of that particular topic. And then method, the method section, you know, protocol and registration, and you should clear well-defined eligibility criteria where you are getting information, information sources, how you have conducted the search, search strategy, how you are selecting the study, data collection process, data item, risk of bias in individual study, summary of measures used, and synthesis of research. This all come under methodology part. And then after, uh, and risk of bias ac across the study and additional analysis. Then under results section, you're going to, uh, uh, what did you find out? After you go through all this process, what is your, what is the result you are coming up with? So how many studies you have selected? What are the characteristic of the studies you have selected? What are the risk of bias within the studies? and the result of individual study, and then synthesis of result and risk of bias across the study. So you can explain risk of bias with individual studies, and then you compare risk of bias with across the study, and if there are any additional analysis. Later come the discussion section. Again, here, summary of the evidence, and limitation and conclusion is a very important part under discussion. So it's very important that at least the last paragraph, you know, leave about talking about limitation. I, I never see any study without any limitation, you know. Majority of the study have always some kind of limitation. So either outcome level or under risk of bias level on incomplete retrieval of identified research or reporting bias, etc. And those factors can be explained under the limitation of the study. And then conclusion, it's provide a general interpretation of the result in the context of the evidence and implication of the 
future research. Usually, you might have noticed by now in the conclusion section, we usually explain about the implication of the future research. And if you have received any funding for conducting the systematic review, that also need to be included in the manuscript. So describe the source of funding for the systematic review and other support, role of funders for the systematic review, etc. That needs to be included. So if you're very much interested in reading systematic review, Cochrane Review is a very good source. High quality systematic reviews are published under this. It's a, a, a systematic review of research in healthcare and health policy that is published in Cochrane Database of Systematic Review. Cochrane Database of Systematic provide excellent source of good quality systematic review, which are considered as a gold standard of evidence-based information. Oh, I'm okay with the timing. But I would request all of you to go through this, you know, this website, it's really interesting. Um, so now let's look at, so I hope you all got an idea about what is systematic review and how to conduct a systematic review. You know? It's not really tough job, right? It's easy. If you follow the Prisma guideline, it is explained every step. If you follow that step by step, it's an easy job. But it does take time. It's not, you know, like a case report or case studies or case series and all, not like that. It does take more time and it does need a teamwork. Multiple people need to be involved to review, right? So why we need systematic review? What, what do you think? Why, are, why we need this one? Especially in Ayurveda, right? It's deliver a clear and comprehensive overview of available evidence on a given topic. That is the important part. It aims to identify, evaluate, and summarize the finding of all relevant individual study over a health-related issue or other important topic. So thereby making it available evidence for more accessible to decision makers. It helps to enable the decision-making process that are maximally informed and minimally biased. That is the key point here well-informed and minimally biased studies for decision-making process, we can provide it. That's why I like the systematic review process. It is a systematic review are conducted in unbiased, rep uh, reproducible way to provide the evidence for practice and policy making and identify a gap in the research also. If when you do the search, when you do, when you go through all the literature only, you will be able to identify if there is any gap in the literature. And that we can mention in our manuscript. So the practice of evidence-based medicine is the integration of individual clinical expertise with the best available external clinical evidence from the systematic research and patients' values and expectation. That is the another key point here. So Ayurveda is moving on evidence-based medicine as an evidence-based practice, right? Evidence-based education. So we do need the evidence from systematic review it will sub definitely support for Ayurveda growth. So Ayurveda has lagged far behind us in scientific evidence in quantity, quality of our cities and systematic review. Definitely we have a growth, definitely we are improving. Uh, like 30 years back where we are and now when we look at in 2020, we have grown extensively, but we still have to grow more, right? There is still, uh, we are still lagging behind compared to other healthcare profession. So out of 7,864 systematic review in Cochrane Library, Ayurveda has only one, right? right? So that shows, you know, we need more studies. Systematic review will help in bridging Ayurveda with evidence-based scientific approach. We need to look at, while comparing all the studies, what is the core evidence about particular intervention? What is the core evidence about particular diagnostic criteria? What is the core evidence for whether this particular method is effective in management of certain disease, right? So for that, we need to compare the study in a systematic way and evaluate the studies which are published based on the criteria. So the, uh, the first example of systematic review was conducted in 1753 by James Lynn, published a paper that aimed to provide a concise and unbiased summary of evidence on scurvy. So look at it, 1753 and now we are 2020 and we still have in Ayurveda only in Cochrane, okay? Uh, only once to systematic review. 
So the design, the methodology and quality of clinical trial on Ayurveda medicine is slowly improving. The number of studies available on particular topic is minimum. And that makes it challenging. I tried, I attempted a couple of times, but sometimes, you know, about the uh, top, particular topic, like for example, I love, I like low back pain, uh, this is uh, that topic, but there are not that many studies published in Ayurvedic medicine to do the best quality systematic review. That can be the another challenge, but we can address this by including all type of studies with the justification. Maybe we don't have to look at or include only RCT. We can look at the um, uh, quasi-experimental study. We can include it sometimes case series if still, and we can create another uh, category with the case studies also. I've seen in uh, Chinese medicine having a systematic review, uh, including RCT, case series, case studies, et cetera. So if you explain that in a methodology, maybe we will be able to address that. Systematic review can be invaluable resource for providing an up-to-date systematic summary of current evidence of uh, for particular intervention. It have the potential to influence the national guidelines. Systematic review can play a major role in growth of evidence-based Ayurveda education and evidence-based Ayurveda practice. Thank you very much. Namaste. I think what is the time? Three twenty. We have ten minutes, right, Dr. Pradipa? And I guess yes, yes. Perfect timing. Perfect timing. Thank you for the wonderful presentation, Dr. Anu. Thank you. It was very explanatory, informative, and you, in my opinion, you did justice to the topic systematic review, going into the details and making it interesting with your own experience. And I agree with you that Ayurveda lags behind and there is not enough research. So let's involve others and make it more interactive. I invite Dr. Pratibha and Daina is here. Let's see what their opinion is. I think Daina had to leave because she messaged me. Okay. Um, but, um, you know, I would love to, I'm curious, uh, typically I know you mentioned that systematic reviews can take a long time. What is an average time period? Because it does seem like a very, tedious process, very thorough process. And yeah. you have done one, right? Have you done I one? A few more, uh, four, mm. five of them. Something. Not in Ayurveda, though. Not in Ayurveda, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it's depend upon your teamwork. Like now, if you are, I mean, we all do multiple job at the same time. Yes. <laughs> that take the little more challenge. And also depend on the topic. If you are mm. selecting the topic, which has already so many articles published, then it mm. may take more time. Mm. You know? Like for example, when I did the low back pain study, initial search might have given about 2000 plus article. Wow. That takes more time. Mm. So, but in Ayurveda, I don't think it take that much time, maybe because mm -hmm. we don't have that many RCTs out there. Usually systematic review, you will see based on RCT, that way it makes it very clear and go step by step process. Mm. Uh, but as I explained, you can include it other study as long as we justify it and explain it. There are mm. studies published like that as well. But mm. if you're seriously putting more time and a very good team of people mm. and we're more dedicated and the topic doesn't have that many articles already published, it won't take much time. Mm. What was your shortest and longest uh, systematic review? Let's get an example from there. Yeah, the... I think the shortest was the one six months or seven months because okay. I have always multiple projects. So mm. it's not one pro that may be the another reason, but if mm. you are only diverting in one project, you may be able to, because I have in my team also, they all worked in a multiple project and mm. I like the systematic review a lot. Uh, you know, I, I value in systematic review. That's another reason I selected that topic today for sharing mm. with our community. And because one thing is, it doesn't need too much you know, big funding to conduct the study. If you're mm. looking for a clinical trial, RCT trial, and a lot of funding and a lot of manpower, you need to have a clinician to treat the patient. You need mm. to have a research assistant to make sure communicating with the patient and you know scheduling the patient, et cetera. And statistician mm. is needed, et cetera. So systematic review, you don't have to spend financially. You know, Funding is not a big challenge. Uh, um, 
but I did use a statistician in one of my systematic review because we kind of used a, we wanted to report a quantitative analysis in the study apart from qualitative analysis. So mm -hmm. there I have used a statistician, but otherwise, you know, it is, it is easy compared to other methods, but it is higher evidence. If you look at that triangle research pyramid, mm. pyramid, a systematic review in the highest evidence. Mm. Very nice. Dr. Mandana, you have any questions? No, right now I do not have any questions. And uh, uh, if everybody permits, we would close the session, announce today's speaker, and share a, a little about CAR, calling about volunteers and members. Yes, I think we can go for that. Okay. So D D Dr. Anupma, your presentation, the people who attended yesterday's presentation, they would feel that it has been so effective in bringing the message that yesterday Dr. Sri Ranjini talked about uh, documenting and communicating in research. And today you spoke about systematic review. And I loved your presentation to tell you honestly, I love your presentation. You made it so effective and interesting by sharing your own experience. And your passion was showing all the way through. And I like the point when you said that I with the legs behind, we need clear and comprehensive communication. We need to evaluate and summarize and well informed and minim minimal bias. So we really need to bring all this to IRIDA research and systematic uh, uh, review methodology. And uh, tomorrow we have our speaker, Dr. Namita Patak, and she will be talking about new directions for research in Ayurveda. So it, this has been planned so well and such interesting and uh, effective speakers that those who attend would definitely will benefit. And this also is one of the, I enjoyed being the part of this as this is one of the things that Ayurveda Research wants to do, to bring information and education to the people involved and interested in Ayurveda, not just in India and at the global level. So we at, Kai, I, uh, at the Council of Ayurveda Research, we are a pioneering initiative and to promote and establish Ayurveda to bring evidence base to Ayurveda research, to Ayurveda through research. So I invite members, volunteers, collaborators to join us and make us global lead. And uh, uh, with this, I would like to end today's session. Thank you very much for your presentation and being part of this. Thank you, Dr. Pratibha. I just want to quickly add that we do have a very special event coming up on November 13th. I have just shared about it. Mr. Ambassador and uh, Consulate General of New York will be joining to give some special address um, on Ayurveda Day on the platform of Council for Higher the Research. So um, anybody who's listening to this, please check out our uh, Facebook uh, event pages and look for details there. But this is um, the special event is going to have a panel discussion uh, with five Ayurveda and um, integrative experts. So please uh, check out the details for that. And thank you once again, Dr. Adam. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Namaste.